Dzień dobry, dobry wieczór. Um, w Ognisku Polskim zapraszamy znowu. Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's concert. Uh, something special. Because it's not just any ordinary day. Today is something called Tłusty Czwartek. Tłusty Czwartek means it's badly translated as Fat Thursday. It doesn't sound nearly as attractive as it does in Polish. But it's, a, uh, it's an opportunity for Polish people and, in fact, everybody to eat as many donuts as you can. <laughs> so, so, along with the glass of wine, which we'll be, we'll be inviting you to afterwards, we've also got a donut for you. <laughs> now, tonight's uh, concert has been very kindly organised by Lord and Lady Goring Douglas, Natasha and Lizzie Douglas, and uh, we're very delighted to welcome you at the club. Lord Douglas, I know, has been here since he was a student, often coming and supporting us. Um, I didn't want to ask about what used to happen here in the student days, <laughs> but maybe after a few lines we'll find out. I will tell you. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I can stop talking now. Please welcome the Lord and Lady Gray Lovers. It's very nice indeed to, to meet you in this lovely concert hall and um, in front of this incredible piano and in this uniquely open and generous and imaginative club of Nisko Polski and to share some of our favourite music and poetry with you. Nikki and I met at the Royal Academy of Music in 1969. It was, I remember, a cold, dark November morning in the oral dictation class. And I was sitting there, it was fog outside the window, it was fog inside the window, it was fog in my heart. <laughs> As I took down this dull musical dictation, suddenly, Illumination in the form of Nikki came in 30 minutes late. <coughs> a tradition she's maintained ever since, <laughs> bringing with her another sort of music, a harmony of the spheres. And I started taking a dictation of a different kind. <laughs> but then the trouble started, you see, because we began playing duets. And as you know in such things, the, the little fingers touch and the hands cross over. <laughs> And the knees knock, and then a kiss, <laughs> many times, <laughs> and then 40 years later, you have six children and 14 grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see so many of them here tonight, Lucy and Natasha and. Josie and Murray and Wilson. So it's usually the fire brand in the family. So the first piece we're playing is this duet by York Bowen, who is um, one of the forgotten giants of, of early 20th century English piano music. And there's a connection because Nicky's piano teacher at the Royal Academy was a certain Harry Isaacs, who formed a very successful piano duo with York Bowen. This piece won a competition in 1918 to find the best duet by a British composer. And being of its time, at the end of the First World War, it expresses something of that with its turbulence and, uh, and drama. And uh, then a feeling again of st stepping footloose and fancy free into a more open, wider world. <coughs>
language for the split second timing is not easy in the least. <laughs> Tashi is singing two songs, but two of them were helping out with the instruments. <laughs>
from a family of six and uh, five sisters and one brother. And uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of interesting family uh, interactions within that, within that dynamic. And um, this song is called Oh Brother. <laughs> and, uh, it follows a rather tragic argument. Uh, I think I was criticizing his parenting skills. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's called Oh Brother. <clears throat> picking um, sea shanties and sea songs and um, yeah I, 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 there's an interesting uh, local story um, about a Dutch ship in 19, uh, 1902 um, yeah, sailing into Dover to deliver a cargo of uh, grand pianos <laughs> um, but the ship uh, ran aground uh, outside Dover and uh, the pianos were uh, hoisted up the cliffs, they were attempted to salvage the pianos, and they were actually hoisted up. Uh, and there's vast chunks of the cliff that, that, that came tumbling down when the pianos were up. And the, the pianos are still played around Dover today. They kind of made their way into the local community. And so I wanted to sing a song called "The Wreck of the Croissant," which is the name of the Dutch ship. Um, but there's a, I actually need a bit of help, um, willing or not willing. <laughs> 
Um, but there's not much choice. Um, I'll sing the song. But I wondered if, if on this side of the room you could do a great favour, which is to sing. Um, well, I'll, it's to the song of uh, Blow the Man Down. It's, uh, I'm going to sing and then you're going to sing back, hopefully. Um, play, play, play piano. And then give it some willy and play piano. So there's a couple of lines. It's play, play, play piano. And then give it some welly, please do. And play piano. I said to give you, give you a quick, quick chance to do that. on this side of the room so she could possibly <laughs> knock out a desk can <laughs> a slightly higher version which is play 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 piano give it some welly and play piano that's this kind of job over here be a quick one a quick chance his heart. And it's true, because they're like his personal diary, and they say, this is what I was doing, and this is what I was feeling about it. And to me, they become a sort of um, something to take with me through life, to comfort and console and, and fortify. And, um, and so here's about five of them, I think. Um, in sonnet number 116, one of the great sonnets, Shakespeare, using words of the marriage service, takes us to the uplands of human thought and describes platonic love as the greatest thing of which we are capable. Not the sort of love which changes or alters when it meets with change and alteration, or is in any way affected by the loss of rosy lips and cheeks but the sort of love that sticks it out to the end. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. 
Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with a remover to remove. Oh no, it is never fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his heights be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. On August the 11th, 1596, Shakespeare's only son, Hamlet Shakespeare, died aged 11 in Stratford-on-Avon of the plague. Um, probably when his dad was away acting with his acting company. And the sonnets were begun soon after this, addressed to a, a beautiful young man. And I think that one of the reasons Shakespeare wrote these poems was his way of coping with this incredible bereavement, his way of coping with crushing, unbearable pain. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, And often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. My dad started all this. He, he was a great Shakespearean, amateur Shakespearean, famous in the 1940s and 50s for his recitation of the sonnets, usually at the end of some big dinner table, with an extremely large brandy in one hand and an even larger cigar in the other, and with his wonderful growly, gravelly, stentorian voice, he would give the event to his favourite poet. He died when I was six, and I scarcely knew the man. But uh, he left behind no money, but one legacy, as far as I was concerned, a very important one, which was an old battered recording of him being interviewed on Australian radio on some business trip in the 1940s and on which he was asked <coughs> to recite a couple of Shakespeare poems. No, one Shakespeare poem, and one my, my, my great uncle Alfred Douglas. And he was um, very nervous, I think, and he got various bits wrong. But this recording was my key into my father's heart, and my inspiration to find out about him by learning the sonnets as he had done. And, um, he had a very clever way of getting my dear brother David sitting over there, I'm so delighted he's here, and my sister Jane isn't here, uh, to learn the sonnets, which was by giving a guinea for every sonnet learned. That's right, David. Two and six, Two and six. 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 Two and and so anyway, quite a few sonnets were learned and quite a few two and sixpences uh, were dispensed. Um, one of my father's favourite poems was number 25, uh, because he got its message, which was basically that the higher you climb 
into grace and favour. The further you have to fall into disgrace and disfavour. How courage is that? Blair, Thatcher, Cameron, Ronson and Trump to come. <laughs> But he basically says in this song, it doesn't matter how many battles you've fought, how many victories you've won, if you fail in the last fight you fight, that is how you will be remembered. Useful information. He also says that to be secure in the arms of a loving friendship is the best defense against such misfortune. Let those who are in favor with their stars of public honor and proud titles boast. Whilst I, whom fortune of such triumph bars, and looked for joy in that I honour most. Great princes' favourites, their fair leaves spread but as the marigold at the sun's eye. But in themselves their pride lies buried, for while a frown they in their glory die. The painful warrior, famous it for might, after a thousand victories once spoiled, is from the book of honour raised quite, and all the rest forgot for which he toiled. And happy I that love and am beloved, where I may not remove, nor be removed. And um, another <coughs> song that I'm sure my brother um, got his two and sixpence for um, was number 29, one of the, the truly great songs, in which Shakespeare talks about disgrace and jealousy of other people's skills and achievements and depression. It's interesting how our favourite 21st century complaint, depression, is doing rather well in the 16th century. Shakespeare says that um, if you think of a loved person, uh, it can lift you above your sorrow, out of your gloomy state. And one of the, the great outlines of English poetry, or world poetry, towards the end of this sonnet, compares Shakespeare's lifting mood to a bird, a lark, soaring from earth to heaven. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. Desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark, a break of day arising from sun and earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. descriptions we have of dementia. So there you go. Um, you see, we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theatre presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits, 
and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. And first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. And then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and his shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking that bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape on mind, <laughs> with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise swords and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and purse on side. His youthful hose well saved the world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history, his second childishness and near oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. place for women to come all together in one room to do weaving and sewing and, and spinning and save candles, just one candle for one room. And they could talk and tell tall stories and laugh and it wouldn't be at all boring for them. And that's what's going on. We've got Natasha making some of the stories sound taller still. So, <laughs> It's, um, it's a great hustle and bustle with things flying, notes flying here and there, and one or two stitches probably being dropped by us.
very short. <laughs> very, very short. Very, very short. Very, very short. Very, very short.